Welcome to the podcast, Medicine Untold, and come with me on a journey to the unexplored side of medicine, where we speak with rebel doctors, radical herbalists, unorthodox healers, and patients who have healed themselves. Explore the intersection between science and spirituality and discover the power within you. I'm your host, Dr. Michelle Berglund, licensed naturopathic doctor, botanical alchemist, and practicing physician. So welcome everyone. Today we have Dr. Klinghart and I'm so excited to have him. So welcome, Dr. Klinghart. Good morning, Misha. <laughs> uh, so Dr. Dietrich Klinghart, MD, PhD, is a world-renowned medical physician who early in his career became interested in the sequelae of chronic toxicity, especially lead, mercury, environmental pollutants, and electromagnetic fields, and their correlation to chronic illness. Dr. Klinghart is internationally recognized for his biological medicine approaches and successful treatments of neurological illness, chronic pain, autism, Lyme disease, and techniques to combine non-surgical orthopedic medicine with immunology, endocrinology, toxicology, and neurotherapy. He is the founder and medical director of the Sophia Health Institute near Seattle in the United States, as well as the founder and chair of the Institute of Neurobiology, Klinghart in Germany. Dr. Klinghart has authored groundbreaking textbooks and publications and created autonomic response testing and the five levels of healing. So that's quite impressive. It was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> um, so kind of to start, can you tell us a little bit about your background and why you focus on chronic illness in your practice today? Yeah, I mean, it's pretty, pretty simple. I mean, I grew up in Germany and went to medical school there. And at the time, that was still a time before the big separation between integrative medicine or alternative medicine and conventional medicine. It was one thing. So we still had courses in herbal medicine. We had uh, obligatory courses in homeopathy and acupuncture. And so when we graduated, we were actually tested on those subjects. So we had to, had to have a good working knowledge of all that. And then um, really like, you know, yeah, after medical school, I did my residency and during the residency, I had the chance to at the same time uh, study psychology and got a degree in that also. And then uh, worked on my PhD, which was a major, major work that took three years uh, on how the autonomic nervous system, the vascular system and the immune system are correlated with each other. So that was sort of my starting point. And then I worked in India for three years, which was um, some of my internship in medicine. I actually did in a hospital in India. And then I got in touch, you know, with Dr. Vasant Lat, who was down the road, our little Ayurvedic doctor, who later on we moved to America and he became famous here. <laughs> but so I had a pretty good, pretty good working knowledge of Ayurvedic medicine and then you know, coming over here, I was kind of shocked that acupuncture, at least at the time in the early 80s, was hardly known. And uh, homeopathy, even though it has a huge history in America, was virtually murdered, you know, by the, uh, the medical history that we all know. And so I sort of um, brought some of my, my German upbringing and what I've experienced over here and then put those things together also had uh, i have to say like a very decisive six months in england with james Suriax, who was sort of the inventor of orthopedic medicine that's a non-surgical way of treating orthopedic conditions which largely involved prolotherapy and uh, different injection techniques um, and then when I came over here, I was first very, very much involved uh, with prolotherapy and treating orthopedic conditions. And, you know, whenever that was successful with the patient, the same patient thought I was special and then brought their mother with cancer and brought their children with autism. And so that I sort of, you know, just took a natural um, evolution and 
becoming sort of the the receiving basket uh, for uh, patients that didn't find help elsewhere. And that happens to be mostly people with chronic illness. And then uh, sort of very quickly by the end of the 80s, I was already pretty knowledgeable about Lyme disease and the first um, treatments, you know, sort of that were available and explored that quite deeply. And so I think sort of by the mid 90s had already developed uh, alternative biological approaches to treat Lyme disease, which made me popular in some circles and very unpopular in other circles. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why I sometimes say I'm the last standing natural path in Seattle because the whole Bastia University and all the students have gone the way treating it with antibiotics and with uh, hard medical drugs. Whereas even though I have a prescription pad available, I went the other way, treating things differently. And since that, on the long run, was far more effective. I sort of became almost like the victim of all the chronic patients in the U.S. Uh, that found many of whom found their way to me, and so it kind of was the natural evolution of of all that, you know, sort of. And it wasn't that I had a particular passion for chronic illness; mm -hmm. it just ended up being that way. And then, you know, we're, during the COVID years, it kind of pretty much fortified my knowledge and my opinions about um, using the, the prior knowledge to deal with the situation, uh, which helped us really guide uh, a lot of people through the crisis without ending up on the respirator and or in the coffin. <laughs> and so we've, um, and so now post COVID, you know, we're, we're facing the issue that uh, people have a flare up of all their chronic illnesses um, and so basically learned that any chronic illness we need to treat now or cancer or autoimmune disease, we have to include uh, the treatment of COVID uh, with it. And that has worked out really well. Right. That's, that's a pretty impressive background with a lot of different variables that you can combine mm -hmm. really during this time. And um and it's interesting. I was I was listening to your background on a, a different video, and and you were discussing kind of your upbringing, exposed to Lyme disease, kind of in a certain region, and how so many people had it. And so it was seemed like all these different things came into your life path to definitely have you specialize yeah. in this. Yeah, yeah. Like you know, I think it's for everybody. Is their own experience becomes the the formative thing in their life. Yeah, the, the area in Germany where I grew up has turned out to be the mother bed of Babesia, Bartonella, <laughs> and Borrelia uh, in Europe. And however, I have to say that the European form of Lyme disease turns out to be much easier treatable than the um, American version, which clearly uh, has man-made uh, characteristics built mm -hmm. into it that makes it so much more vicious. Hmm. Yeah, that definitely makes it difficult, Tim. Um, so tell us a little bit more about your five levels of healing, like how you developed it and really where you got your inspiration to develop it and utilize that. Yeah, I mean, uh, of course, you know, through my years in India, I had, uh, which was the reason why I was there for, I had some fairly deep uh, spiritual experiences to experience healing on a very, very different level uh, than what we experience here. And then in the years I studied psychology, I saw the limits and the beauty of uh, psychotherapy. And then <clears throat> very early on in my practice, which was in Santa Fe, New Mexico, which, by the way, for a while, we were the second largest pain center in the country. You know, was Seattle was at the university, was Dr. Bonica was a big guru of pain management, but um, had a clinic there. But at the time, pain management wasn't on the map of American mm -hmm. physicians. And me and a brilliant osteopathic physician, Dr. James Baum, uh, in Sanofi established the, the Sanofi Pain Center. And we had our own radiologist 
we had like access to surgery to um, be doing quite invasive things with pain management. So we learned our way um, around that, you know, but the, the main discovery, you know, that since I was Lyme literate, you know, by the time we got very deeply into pain management, we realized that many chronic pain syndromes had everything to do uh, with chronic infections and that link between uh, chronic pain and chronic illness and chronic infections has to become hugely uh, documented now in the literature. Um, but we kind of were early on with that. And then, of course, taking a deep dive into that, we realized that infections only grow in contaminated body uh, terrains. And that's usually the heavy metals that play a huge role there. And then the question came up, why does not everybody with the same burden get the same illness? And then we realized, okay, there was more to the human condition. And then we explored what's now called the energy body, you know, which is all the phenomena of physics that happen in our body, the emission of biophotons from the cells of, of electric impulses, the micro circuits that happen in the brain and that you can actually diagnose and treat on that level as well. And, you know, this is sort of where acupuncture comes in and the work with infrared light and sauna therapy and uh, magnetic fields and uh, microcurrent, you know, which now sort of is slowly uh, making its impact in even in conventional circles. And then we realized that wasn't it, you know, sort of that when people had uh, early trauma history and life, uh, that the outcome of things that would work on everybody else uh, would not be so good. And that we actually had to go uh, to the level of psychology um, to address the early trauma uh, and resolve, help the patient resolve that. And so I was actually the first one in the U.S. to use uh, eye movement, an eye movement technique you know, that later on uh, through uh, Mr. Shapiro became like famous under the name EMDR, but we were using that technique way before. And so, and then realized, okay, well, that was the key to a lot of illnesses. And then, however, it didn't stop there. And then still, you know, looking at the treatment failures, uh, we realized that the trauma that is affecting the health of people um, can actually be the trauma that happened in the family and the generations before uh, the patient lived to their parents, their grandparents, their great-grandparents. And we started to explore the realm of what's in psychology called now transpersonal psychology. But these are influences on our health that are beyond our own life that didn't start with conception until now, the influence, but it actually goes much further back. And so to, um, to put that in a, in a framework, I uh, remembered uh, my teachings that I received in India, the, the teachings of Patanjali. He is the guy who um, probably five to 12,000 years ago, nobody knows, um, created yoga. And yoga you know, was meant to be a technique to cleanse the body in a way that um, you can connect with the divine easier. You know, the, the recognition that a toxic contaminated body, um, you, you cannot pray, you cannot connect to the divine, the divine cannot connect to you, that you sort of like your body vibrations are on a whole different level that has nothing to do with the higher levels. And so basically the, the sequence that evolved is, um, and then there's this thing in philosophy called downward causation. That means if you have a trauma on a higher level, let's say, you know, your, your parents were a Holocaust victim, somehow one of them survived it. And so, and you know, you gave life and then your parents or grandparents uh, are hoping to leave that behind and you're now living a life, but you spend your whole life in fear and eventually fear will eventually affect the kidneys 
and then sort of and you may present um, to the physician with the cadmium overload in the kidneys and beginning kidney failure. And so then, yes, you can detox cadmium and that may help for the moment. And it's an ongoing job anyway, to so get cadmium out of the kidneys. But you, you can do that and the patient will improve as long as they stay on treatment. But if you can go back and resolve it on the level where the actually the origin was to heal the people that died in the Holocaust and to heal the, the people that emerged from it alive, a few of them, and the people that were traumatized uh, because of my family members, and you go there with the healing, then suddenly there's this trickle-down effect that we call down the causation that heals on all levels. And it's, of course, very, very cost-effective for the patient because you do one treatment and then over a few weeks or months afterwards, everything cleans itself up. You stop retaining metals, you, the, your immune system wakes up and deals with the infections, and your, your energy body straightens out, your chakras open up, your meridians open up, your autonomic nervous system becomes functional, your mind gets clear, you stop having anxiety, you know, so you sleep better at night with all the consequences of that, and it's very profound, you know, and so we call that the five levels of healing, you know, that's when a patient comes to us, we try to make an assessment that not only applies to the physical body, you know, by doing the regular functional medicine stuff, it's nice and good, but it's not complete. And then we have, I've developed a technique, you know, the ART, the autonomic response testing, that allows us to, um, beyond the lab work, to test the energy body, that's primarily what we do, but then we can, once we clean that up, we very easily stumble into the, what we call the mental body, that's the realm of psychology, and find all sorts of issues there, traumatic events, unresolved conflict that we deal with quickly and easily without complicating it. <laughs> and then that may open up the access to the fourth level. You know, we suddenly we see like big issues uh, raining down from, from, from above. And then, yes, there's the fifth level, that's that sort of connection, that the individual connection that the patient has with the divine. And I do not interfere with that. That is private to the patient and should not be messed with. Um, like some gurus try and some um, psychotherapists try and some regular people try, that is not to be messed with. So that's pretty much it. So we have these five levels. And they're all interactive with each other, of course. And um, uh, illnesses can be caused on each one of the five levels. And it's a wrong assumption that somebody has back pain, that it's just the pressure of the disc on a nerve. And when you remove the disc, everything will be fine. Well, it may be, and it may be for a while, or well, the pain moves somewhere else. And... Um, it's best to um, use a method of diagnosing that looks at all the levels and um, accommodates uh, treatment that address all of the issues. This is, uh, you know, of course, as a, as a physician, you have a limited time in a particular visit and you, it's always good to start on the physical level and work your way up. Um, but not to linger on the physical level forever, like most people, you know, like the even after two years of taking vitamins and supplements and herbs, that kind of thing. Well, I just need to find the right combination of vitamins and I will get well. And so they keep looking and looking and looking and spend more and more money on very, very sophisticated, ever increasing and delicate blood tests and, and breath tests and urine tests and skin tests and uh, uh, x-rays and ultrasound and imaging techniques and now the whole body MRI is now popular. And yes, it gives us all valuable information, but it pretty much shows the outcome of something deeper that has happened in the patient. And most chronic illness has components that go all the way up 
uh, to the fourth level. Right. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I completely agree with you. And you're really like a pioneer in the mind body medicine field. And you combined a lot of different elements, especially taking like the ancient Vedic culture and the, the beliefs there and really combining it with the medicine, like to me, it's, there's no question that all of those things are deeply tied in and that's, that's the real way to heal. Um, well, you kind of already answered this question, but I'll ask you it just if you have uh, other thoughts is what's your personal view on how emotions affect the body? Well, emotions, you know, are a complex event, you know, sort of on a physical level, you can explain emotions with the mix of neurotransmitters that have been excreted into the bloodstream by the autonomic nervous system usually and um, the effect on the brain the subjective effect is the particular set of feelings uh, but you can also look at it on the second level um, it's the activation of certain aspects of the autonomic nervous system highly involved now we know from uh, or beautiful researchers on this level, that the vagus nerve, uh, which is sort of kind of half the autonomic nervous system, that the vagus nerve is highly involved with that. And uh, there's changes, that electrochemical changes that can be measured now. You know, so when you have emotions, uh, you can do the heart rate variability and other tests to um, look at it on this level. Or the psychologist you know, will look at it on the, on the third level and look at more what triggered the emotion and deal with that. Um, and so emotions are, are complex, but they're typically triggered uh, by perceptions. That's, uh, you know, through the sensory organs, that's a second level issue in our system. Uh, and that triggers then a storm of events, you know, that is affecting the brain, how it behaves, what it perceives, how it filters things, and then you get this excretion of neurotransmitters in the bloodstream there and then reverse stream through the brain and change your brain chemistry and it's always a wild thing emotions are really a wild thing and i think um, i'm suspecting if there's other planets and other beings out there that they don't have that i think it's a unique thing to us humans and um, makes us very human and precious it's a beautiful feedback system uh, that we have, you know, we can, if somebody is in an emotion, whether it's anger or sadness or whatever it is, usually we can recognize it in their face, which is the vagus nerve expressing itself in that way for the autonomic ganglia and the innervation uh, of the of the faces, which is different from the innervation of your shoulders and your belly muscles. And um so emotions are a beautiful, complex thing, but usually they're secondary to something else and sort of we kind of looking at that. You know, the, the way emotions really go is like you, you have a perception, you see something, you hear something, and then it goes through the filter of your beliefs, prior experiences gets filtered out and then leads to... Um, uh, to the feeling, and then that then determines your choices and your actions that follow. And so emotions have an important role in all of that. Right. Yeah. And I think you explained it really well, because it's it's all about the perception and the beliefs, too, of how the emotions are expressed. And so getting to the root of that and finding the truth of the experience and and removing all the limited beliefs and the associations and everything that that's attached to it and then causes the responses in the body. Um, now moving on to the next question, you have developed a method called the autonomic response testing. So really what is that technique and how do you use this technique in your clinical practice? Yeah. So by the way, I was just going back to the last one, I forgot an important piece here. So there's a German wonderful uh, brain researcher, a professor somewhere, um, who really uh, made the point and proved the point that COVID was a um, targeted attack on the hippocampus. That's the structure in the brain next to the amygdala. Both those structures are highly involved, 
how we feel and what we feel. And that is sort of like now uh, greatly under attack and changes um, on a very deep level who we are. But this is sort of like just a little finishing note on emotions. And so autonomic response testing, of course, is the outcome of a lot of um, <laughs> a lot of learnings. Um, for me, it started um, uh, in Germany, learning uh, electroacupuncture according to Dr. Voll. Some of the listeners may have had treatment with that, you know, where you either measure the, the current flow through acupuncture points in the hand, and then there's a machine that then puts frequencies into the system and see which ones correct the, the readings that you're getting. And that was developed by Dr. Foll, and Dr. Foll happened to be my family physician when I grew up. So I kind of thought that was medicine, you know, to actually use electrodermal testing, as it's called now, electrodermal screening, EDS, um, that that was the real medicine, the real diagnostic method. I was like surprised when I went to medical school. Where is it? <laughs> Nobody was teaching it. And if they were aware of it, they were poo-pooing it. And so on. However, you know, it's just what got our family through um, very hard times. Um, and so that was my beginning. And sort of, and then I was very good at it and then moved to America. And the first thing that happened within really like three or four months of starting my medical practice at the time in Santa Fe, uh, the medical board sent its, its soldiers to my clinic and they arrested that instrument. So I was without instrument. And so um, I had to then decide, you know, so based on my understanding, um, this was all the, the testing that Dr. Foll had developed was all related to changes in the autonomic nervous system, which were, as it turns out, through the, the research of Candace Pert, who actually got a Nobel Prize for it, actually turns out that the autonomic ner nervous system is in control of the uh, of the white blood cells of the immune system you know, that is often forgotten. We always talk about the immune system and the different cells and the monocytes and what they're all doing or so, but they all have uh, receptors uh, in the cell wall that receives messages spilled into the blood by the autonomic nervous system. And so I was aware of that from my own uh, thesis, from my own research. And so I was looking for other techniques to assess the autonomic nervous system. And so the first thing I came across, of course, in the US was applied kinesiology uh, with Dr. Goodhart. So I took the so-called 100 hour training in that who became pretty proficient in using that. And then I realized the mistakes that were in it and I was looking for other techniques. And I found the uh, Professor Yoshiaki Umura in New York who was a, a brilliant, brilliant Japanese researcher who developed a different way of manual muscle testing using the, the finger muscles, the muscles that make a ring between the fingers and they are prying them apart. And uh, if there's stress in the autonomic nervous system, it weakens the ring. And if the autonomic nervous system signals a healing response to something, it strengthens the O-ring test. That was a test that was closer to my heart. And so I developed that and then gradually over time uh, merged uh, the techniques and the knowledge that I had about that. And that evolved into the autonomic response testing, which my humble opinion is clearly uh, currently the best way of manual testing that is superior to the AK the superior to the O-ring test alone and superior to electroacupuncture um, with the with the ART test, we've been able to you know develop treatments for Lyme disease that are non-toxic, purely biological, that work. And the literature is always following the literature, the emerging in medicine supports what we found. Uh, we found uh, solutions for, for Epstein-Barr. Uh, we found solutions you know, for all the pain-related issues um, that are very profound, that go quite a number of levels deeper than what other techniques uh, have brought to light. And so 
Uh, that's really all I can say. And so when we do the testing, it looks pretty much like a mix of uh, kinesiology and O-ring testing. You know, so it's both as part of the technique. And um, it's a technique that is not depending on me. So I've taught virtually thousands of students worldwide, uh, the largest contingent of um, very proficient uh, practitioners in Australia, New Zealand, in wow. India. Um, there is uh, a huge group of practitioners in Europe, Sweden, Denmark, Germany. Uh, and then now it's also swept into Russia and into the Eastern European countries. And so it's it's around. It's just in the U.S. Um, there is uh, even old friends that are in functional medicine, sort of, because there is a slow learning curve to it. It's not a popular technique in the U.S. Everything has to be like McDonald's kind of drive by. You know, you learn one technique and for one day, and then that's what you use. And this takes a bit longer, uh, and so. It doesn't have the popularity in the U.S. that it deserves, but it's, you know, the, the current times are not supporting um, long learning curves, you know, supporting the quick and easy. And so, of course, ordering a lab test um, requires a stroke of a pen, and you don't have to learn any particular thing with that. And so... And it, you know how it is right now, people spend thousands of dollars in lab tests, and then the outcome is always predictable that you're trying to fix the patient's condition with giving a particular um, you know, group of supplements or, or herbs or medicines, and then hoping for the best. You know, And um, if it's not working or working just a little bit, you sort of then you try more lab testing and... <clears throat> You go forth and back, you know, sort of, and eventually probably have the best protocol that's possible on the physical level, but you still, the patient still isn't all the way well. Right. No, I, I completely agree with you on that, too. I think especially in the U.S., it's moved to physical tests and you lose that connection with the patient and seeing them and filling them and having them be exposed to different therapies. So it's, it's really gone a different way, but um, I think this podcast and bringing that information out there, I think there are physicians that want to bring that back, that element and, and combine it all in a different way too. So I'm thankful you're teaching that to physicians and practitioners as well. Um, yeah, and you know, we have, uh, I do have a team of uh, doctors with me at the Sophia Health Institute in Woodenville, which is a suburb of Seattle. We do have a team of practitioners who are very good with it and are equally, you know, following what we've learned and are equally proficient in doing it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's great. You can offer it there too. I'm I think that people come pretty much from all over the world, right? To go to your clinic in in Woodenville and in the Seattle area too to to have those treatments and to have that unique experience. Yeah. Um, so the next question I have for you is what are the seven most common factors that block or stress the healthy functioning of the nervous system? Yeah. So we, um, you know, this has been years in the making, I actually just published a book on that, the seven factors of healing. Now, you know, let me see if I can, get them together you know so so on the on the physical level it's mostly infections and toxins that are affecting people you know and so but infections also exert their effect on the human body by either secreting biotoxins or by arousing the immune system and then the immune system creates all the symptoms so that's one factor you know sort of and then one of the big overlooked ones is the structure you know so when people have lost teeth or have a poor bite we know now with all the research there's a huge effect on the brain on the acetylcholine production on brain fog and memory problems and all the things that people complain about now 
nobody looks at the structure. You know, so we are very busy and uh, sending people to have the uh, the teeth worked on you know, in different ways uh, to get um, it's clear from the research that people um, when they've lost teeth and get a regular denture there's no positive effect on the brain well if you get um, a ceramic implant and build up the bite and so the patient can actually chew properly that repairs the the brain damage from it you know so this is uh, so factor number two is the the structure of the body and then of course we know chiropractic and osteopathy uh, the fantastic tools uh, to correct things on the server that will indeed all have effects on the on the rest of the body really primarily through the autonomic nervous system yeah, and then uh, there is a the thing that's kind of not well known uh, in the U.S. is the effect of what's called interference fields. Uh, typically, are scars from surgeries. Uh, so, uh, scars are a different tissue from normal um, body tissue, um, and when we moving, they're building up a frictional electricity that constantly discharges itself in the autonomic nervous system and also in the sensory nervous system. And then uh, the signal goes to the hypothalamus and then the hypothalamus directs the, the autonomic nervous system and the signals going from there to particular body parts. And so it's common that a, a scar from a C-section causes migraine headaches or that uh, appendectomy scar very typically causes the, the growth of fibroids and other problems in the pelvic area. And uh, I could give you on here, the, the scars from the tonsillectomy uh, very often later in life cause knee pain. And so rather than treating the knee pain, we treat the scars. And so uh, that uh, treatment is called neural therapy. And there's actually a great meeting coming up um, in Seattle in, I think it's the beginning of the first week of April. Um, Jeff Harris is the naturopath in Seattle who uh, now runs the North American uh, Academy of Neural Therapy. So that's a, that's a wonderful tip for some of you guys that, that are actually, I mean, condition is that you're allowed to inject and then that's all you need. And then uh, you get some wonderful, simple tools to, to help the patient. And then the other issue on the second level is the electrosmog. Yeah, so we know there is a huge growing body of literature on the effect of Wi-Fi and household electric fields and geopathic stress. Um, that is sort of something I can lecture about for days. But the basic outcome uh, is definitely with Wi-Fi, with the hand, handy um, radiation, um, is that uh, it penetrates the body and in the cells, it causes an opening of the what's called the voltage-gated calcium channels and the cell gets flooded with calcium and then leads to a cascade of reaction called the no-ono cycle. And at the end of that, the cell produces peroxynitride which is rocket fuel. <laughs> it's completely destructive to pretty much everything in the body. And so the, the, it's pretty simple, the, the knowledge about it. Um, Marty Paul, Martin Paul, P-A-L-L, -L, is the one who wrote the most beautiful summary papers on this. And this is something I, I know most naturopaths, most medical doctors, are completely underestimating the destructiveness of that. And of course, we're all based in it 24-7. There's no control group. You know, somebody wakes up and says, hey, look, this person looks in a part, lives in a part of town where there is no Wi-Fi. But I can give you an example, you know, sort of, of the, the direct impact in the Seattle area. So for some strange reason, <laughs> COVID broke loose in America, in Seattle, and not just in Seattle, but in a particular part of Seattle called Kirkland. And Kirkland happened to be the first place in the U.S. that prided itself that was for the first, that was the first part 
of the US where 5G was completely switched on. It was the very first place. And just a few months before COVID broke loose. And so, and then the interesting thing was that then the, the patients in old folks' homes that got so sick with it, they happened to live in old folks' homes that had completely newly established complete 5G access in them. And so, and then these poor patients that got sick were brought to one particular hospital that was chosen, chosen of Evergreen Hospital in Kirkland, uh, which prided itself was the first hospital in the U.S. that fully had switched on 5G. And the death rate of the people that went there was 60%, six zero. That means out of 10 patients that went there, only four came out alive. And so in the background, unbeknownst to the authorities and anybody else, I got involved and so informed the different old folks' homes you know, that still had some alive people and told them there is another solution. And so I'm not going to tell you <laughs> what that was, but we um, um, that changed the music and then the death rate went way, way down. Um, but this is sort of like the, uh, one of the seven factors is the Wi-Fi environment. You know? So um, then there is, of course, we, we want to give it some credit, is the effect of nutritional or microcurrent, uh, micronutrient deficiencies, uh, which now have become very, very common. And the reason is pretty simple. You know? So when we uh, look at spinach today, there is no more iron in spinach. Um, when we look at the the overall uh, content of basic um, elements in the food that has dramatically decreased in the last 60 or 70 years uh, to catastrophic amounts. You know? So um, to get enough zinc and iron and molybdenum and uh, all the other basic elements from the food um, is harder and harder. And so and if people have uh, a disturbed gut, like most people have now, um, from whatever the reasons are, and it, but they call it leaky gut or SIBO or uh, malabsorption, whatever it is. But um, in addition to the food not containing really what our daily needs are, um, we are also having trouble absorbing and extracting from the food what we need. So, yes, the micronutrient assays and all that uh, have a valuable place. Uh, and but should not be considered on their own. So I mean, and beyond that, of course, we have the, the field of psychology um, that I mentioned that before, unresolved trauma is certainly one of the seven factors, unresolved conflict, unresolved trauma um, are constantly um, decreasing the patient's vitality and ability to be resilient towards stresses and um, have direct connections to particular subsets of symptoms. And so it's one of the seven factors here you know, so that we always look at. And then one I already mentioned is the higher psychological issues um, that um, have to do with past uh, family issues you know, conflict, traumata. And of course, you know, there is, on this level, there is also the more darker side of the spiritual world that I don't want to don't want to talk about it here. It's not the, the appropriate thing, but there is other forces that influence us uh, that can greatly contribute uh, to uh, medical illness and there is certainly is a room for prayer and for meditation and for the softer techniques. Um, I'm pretty sure I've forgotten one or two of the factors. Um, I don't have the list here in front of me, but uh, I think that's pretty complete. You know, so we, we try to understand that there is only seven possible causes of illness. It's just not like the whole world of possibilities that makes us think it can really be subdivided in seven issues, each of them have their own diagnostic approaches 
and each of them has their own treatment approaches. And when they're appropriately used, treatments tend to be gentle, they tend to be biological, they tend to be inexpensive, and they tend to be available everywhere. Okay, and um, and you said you just wrote a book on on the seven factors as well. It, it's like all my books in German. And so oh, okay. We haven't found, yeah, we had, it's interesting, after all these years, we haven't found any publishers that are interested in my work. And so I just, you know, I'm relaxed with that, you know, if I'm not pushing myself, you know, so mm -hmm. into the marketplace like other people do, and I'm not the clever marketing person sort of that has like some some ideas and then you know puts them together with all the knowledge that's out there and puts a clever book together that is other people are doing good jobs with that you know and and um, I, I don't want to diminish that it's important that people put the current knowledge that's out there together but um, I do that uh, in Germany where I'm very very popular with that and so I go, you know, with that, I go where I'm asked to go. Right. And and this is a great way to bring it to the people here, too. If, if we can't read the book or if it's in German, it's it's good to understand and understand all the factors too involved in it. Yeah, I do want to say, you know, sort of I've set up, you know, my practice in Woodenville in a way that we're addressing all those issues, you know, very del deliberately with our patients. And so, and of course, I've distributed some of the chores uh, to some of the other physicians. We have a very gifted uh, person working with the psychological aspects. It's Debula Strange. Um, and so, but we have, you know, our own subspecialists, you know, so each of the seven levels. Of course, it's not for everybody to do everything. Um, that was my job for many years. And so now I'm trying to... Um, do just what I love doing on a particular day and then delegate the other things to the people that work close with me. Right, right. And so tell us a little bit more about that. What are some of the unique modalities that you use to treat patients at the Sophia Health Institute in the U.S.? So first of all, um, is my diagnostic workup. You know, I, yes, I look at the lab work, I look at the big markers, but I don't have this patient spend thousands of dollars initially. But occasionally, yeah, we may have to go there. Um, but basically, I do my ART exam and go very carefully through the seven factors. And so, uh, for example, you know, to detect the effect of the um, of the Wi-Fi on a patient, um, we have a particular subset of tests that focuses on the pineal gland, which is the most sensitive organ in the body uh, to Wi-Fi, and then um, have uh, ways of assessing the home. So we may send a SWAT team to the homes to look at the, uh, take some measurements of the intensity of radiation that's in the sleeping location and other places in the home. Um, so that will be one one aspect of it. One thing I'm very good at, and only one of a few physicians in the US, is doing neural therapy, which is the looking at the scars and autonomic ganglia um, and treat them when they're dysfunctional. For example, I may put a DMPS into the sphenopalatine ganglion. Uh, I may inject ozone into the tonsils. Um, I may typically use ozone in many of the joint problems. Um, I use, whenever it's available, um, artisanate uh, to uh, to treat cancer and and um, use uh, injectable, you know, curcumin and, and some of the um, uh, spermidine and, and other things that are uh, available if you're looking for it. Um, I do... Um, a very careful exam of the bite and typically send people to a dentist who actually uh, can follow our guidance on that and is willing to do that. Um, let me see what else we do. Yeah, we, we do uh, the low-dose immunotherapy um, that was 
it's really an offshoot of homeopathy, you know, but we'll be testing very carefully if somebody um, is affected. Right, currently, very, very many people are affected by strep. I know that uh, pertussis, whooping cough is around, uh, very, very prevalent, but people don't look at that. And so um, I may, uh, for that, establish an herbal antibiotic protocol. Um, I may inject ozone, like I said, in the tonsils and the lymphatics. Um, I may, um, yeah, <laughs> I use acupuncture. I use um, uh, many manual techniques. Um, so I'm kind of known for my neck treatments for people that had whiplash injuries. That's a um, uh, complicated and complex manipulation procedure where the, the, the joints and nerves of the neck are numbed temporarily with procaine. And then there's a very strong uh, manipulation of the neck traction torsion maneuver that um, has saved many, many people from chronic neck pain. Um, yes, we do intravenous therapies. We use a lot of uh, intravenous herbal products, but also the usual ozone and UBBI and the, you know, the nutrients, vitamin C. I'd like to use the chance here to say that, you know, so vitamin C typically arrives in glass bottles. And the glass is made of um, aluminum silicate. And so what happens when the company, you know, whether McGuff or whoever produces them, um, dissolves the vitamin C and puts it in a bottle and it sits on the shelf for a few months and it comes to you, the vitamin C actually leaches out aluminum. And so most of the uh, supplies of uh, um Vitamin, injectable vitamin C that arrive at the offices in the US are highly uh, loaded with uh, aluminum. And so it should be in boron glass or some other thing, or it should be a dry powder that you reconstitute um, at the time of injection, or um, it should be a very short way between producing it and using it. And so we use a variety of that, um, paying attention to that. I think very unique for us is also our approach uh, to aluminum toxicity. Now we found out that um, through a German researcher, wonderful, uh, gifted um, uh, brain researcher and a medical doctor, it's a woman actually, and um, she did research on the ionic foot bath and showed that a uh, 30 minute ionic foot bath, it's a you know, the feet are suspended in water and there's a coil in there and um, that it leads to a two to four hundred fold uh, release of aluminum through the urine in the patient within the next few days afterwards. And so we've uh, we tried to diagnose aluminum toxicity in everybody, which is really the big overlooked uh, toxin of our time. Um, that you know, Chris Axley and other researchers have shown is the main cause of the brain deterioration in the U.S. is aluminum, really in combination with Lyme disease, um, and the Epstein Barr and the herpes viruses and all that is more secondary, and mercury is always in the pie. You know, and so uh, we diagnose that we may pe put people on a very strict mercury detox program, which involves plant-derived compounds, it involves giving binders like Cruella, but it also involves um, intravenous therapies uh, that we very carefully select from what's available. And we use um, uh, compounds that are difficult to, to find, that are very, very highly effective in getting mercury out. And um, just maybe as a reminder, you know, Aluminum detox is a completely different animal from detoxing mercury and lead. Lead toxicity is sort of one of my more recent hobbies. It's overlooked how huge the <clears throat> burden of the American society is with lead. It's in the bones. Uh, if you do just a urine test or a hair test, it won't show, but it causes osteoporosis and shrinking of the bone. And when you get older, it slowly gets released and causes reverse toxicity uh, that is very, very profound. <clears throat> and so 
we're looking at all that. And so pretty much every patient that I see walks out with a strong um, detox program, which usually will take a year or two or three to get to an end point with that or to a reasonable level with that. Um, but the treatment results are dramatic uh, when you approach this a proper way. Wow, so you do a lot of unique and very powerful treatments there and a lot of things that people aren't even aware of that are affecting their bodies. But then, of course, you know, there is the whole area of psychology, you know, where I've developed my own techniques, the um, PK work and the MFT, mental field therapy, they may target the approaches that address trauma and conflicts and patients and unresolved issues. And then in addition to that, uh, once a week in the office, I do family constellation work. That's a work to really heal ancestral trauma. Yeah, And so that's offered to my patient. Not everybody uh, takes me up on that offer, but it's fantastic when people do it. The, the treatment results are beautiful. Right. Yeah. And it's powerful to combine all of those too. Mm. Okay. So I have one last question for you today. Um, in today's age, what is your view on the electromagnetic fields that people are exposed to on a daily basis? And what are some simple actions that they can take to limit their exposures? Yeah, I mentioned already, you know, the biology of, of Wi-Fi, you know, the deepest level of what it does. Um, you know, um, everybody is exposed to it. And so it's really a question of minimizing our exposure. So the first issue is, you know, that the Wi-Fi router people have at their home is a cell phone tower, you know, sort of in the Wi-Fi router when it's switched on is a transmitter of very, very huge unpredictable amounts of radiation that covers the entire home. So this one, yeah. So the Wi-Fi router needs to be off when it's not used. And it definitely needs to be off at night. And the best solution is to get rid of it and to get a wired connection, which is not expensive and is easy to do, but that's a tough one to the American to uh, convince them. Um, and many people really say, I'd rather die of cancer then give up my Wi-Fi router. Yeah, so that's really sort of what we're up against with that. And then there is the, the effects of dirty electricity, underground currents, that's sort of the normal electric currents in the household. Uh, there are, tend to <laughs> build up uh, strengths of field uh, in, in different areas in the house. And if your sleeping location happens to be in that part of a field, um, you have no chance. You know, that's the most common cause of insomnia and then chronic, uh, yeah, a huge participator in developing chronic illness. And so the, the best solution is to switch the fuses off at night for the entire house. That has cured a lot of people from their chronic illness. But again, <laughs> a lesser solution of that is a, a switch that electricians know how to install. It's called a demand switch. It's a wireless tool that you have by your bedside and when you push a button, that switches off all the fuses that control the circuitry of your bedroom. <laughs> and that's, um, that's a wonderful tool. And again, it's uh, not every patient takes me up on that. So people really say they rather like the convenience. And I said, well, really all I'm asking you is to buy a $3 flashlight to put it by your nightstand and to have this thing with the button there. It costs a couple of hundred bucks to install that. It's not astronomically expensive. So that's another tool. And then of course, um, there's geopathic stress. Geopathic stress is radiation that comes from the earth. It's very, very common in the uh, Seattle area because we're on a group of fault lines that run under our bums through the houses and through the clinics and through the uh, environment. And so, and when you're on, uh, when the sleeping location is on one of those lines, you will get sick. 
Yeah, so um, I'll give you an example. Yeah, so this was a woman uh, that came in once for treatment. She had brain cancer and a uh, large, a large tumor in the brain, malignant tumor. And so I diagnosed with my test that she was sleeping on one of those stress lines and that she needed to change bed location. And so uh, she went home, didn't contact me for a while, and she called me like after a few months and said, Dr. Klinger, I got good news. My tumor is now shrunk to the size of a cherry. It was the size of an orange. Um, and so after a few months, it was completely gone without any further treatment. And then um, a few years later, the sad news came in. She called me without ever seeing her in between. She called me and said, listen, I just want to tell you, my son, at, at the time of the one concert I had with her, the son was like four years old. And so she just told me, this is now two or three years later. The son must be six or seven. She said, you know, uh, my son just died. You know, he had the same brain tumor that I had. And then I asked her, okay, wait a moment, okay. When I asked you two years ago to move your sleeping locations, did you actually do that? You said, yeah, I, I did it. I moved uh, into the location where my son was sleeping. And then what you do with your son? Well, I moved him to where I was sleeping. <laughs> so he was sleeping now in that same location where she got a brain tumor. He got the same brain tumor and died from it. And so people are not tend to have a lot of common sense or intelligence and so um, we need to kind of be a bit more aware. So the sleeping location can be a huge impact um, in terms of the overall electromagnetic exposures or this may be, ion, this may be ionizing radiation from the earth. <clears throat> so that's one set of tools that we use to diagnose and do simple things like this. But then on a more physical level, yes, we do have proof that the protective clothing works. The shirts that have metalized uh, threads in them, uh, they do reflect Wi-Fi. And so we have uh, different companies. Um, there's um, also the sleep uh, sanctuary, we call it. It like, looks like a mosquito net that people put over the bed um, that really hugely reduces the incoming Wi-Fi from, from the neighborhood, you know, assuming people have switched off their own Wi-Fi router and uh, dealt with the electric fields in the bedroom, calm that down, then the sleep sanctuary is incredibly effective in helping people to get their health back. Uh, there's a, a company that I happen to with, there's probably others, but it's called littletreegroup.com uh, that makes custom makes those for people. And there's blankets and things, but I, I, I'm a strong uh, friend of the shirts that cover like the large body parts. It's the overall um, body surfaces that are exposed to it that matter. So you don't have to kind of cover you know, everything, but the large body parts should be covered with it. And so I work with that, I walk with that. Um, the uh, things that are available are not super expensive. And they're extremely effective. I know there's people argue, oh, no, no, this cannot work and there's bad physics and there's blah, blah, blah. Well, I've done it for 30 years. It works. You know? So, And then there's internal things that can pe people can do. There's certain herbs like rosemary, uh, there's uh, propolis that have been shown to be hugely radioprotective. And so uh, I always test people with my technique for those. And so there's very few patients of mine that are not on rosemary tincture or on propolis tincture. Yeah, so those are the, the key tools um, to protect the cells from the incoming uh, Wi-Fi radiation. And there's, uh, of course, you know, the, I have a whole day lecture on this, but these are sort of some of the key pieces to that. I mean, that's excellent. And we're, we're being sure to put up um, all your information too, and the resources you have and the links to your website so everybody can find it or if they want to dig a little bit more, get more information on it as well. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. It was nice uh, connecting with you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for taking the time today and telling us about 
your whole process and, and your different modalities. So I greatly appreciate it. And I'm thankful to share it with my audience too. Yeah, but people shouldn't forget that life is good. Life is precious um, and very enjoyable. And so let's keep it that way and make, you know, make life easy. There's just a few things that need to be addressed and then life will be good for most people. Exactly. I agree. Just bringing them back more into balance with themselves. Well, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you.